critical thinking. And that's the way to annihilate truth. When you believe that something's wrong, what do you do? You get the future that you work for and you plan for. You get the future that you fight for. And that's the one thing that we can do that's hopefully on the consumer. We need to keep studying these markets to really predict the implications for social welfare. If we don't have privacy, we don't have the sanctity of our own mind. I have the faith that we can, in fact, tackle these problems. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's special edition of SFU City Conversations When Facts Fail Municipal Policy in the Disinformation Age. I'm Meg Holden. I direct the Urban Studies program at SFU across the street, and I'm also a professor of geography here. And it is very exciting and uh, encouraging to see how many of you have come out in the driving rain to talk about this important topic with us. I acknowledge to begin that we are gathered here today on the traditional unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And that also today's event is taking part as part of SFU Public Square's 2019 Community Summit. How many people have been party to other pieces of the summit so far this week, uh, including the big debate on Tuesday evening? Each event within the Community Summit of the 12 is meant to explore both the complexity and the consequences of misinformation, and also to emphasize that solutions to this problem are possible. Our sponsors for today's event are the SFU City Program, SFU Vancouver, and I'd also like to thank our Community Summit presenting sponsors, the Jaroslawski Foundation, the City of Vancouver, and Microsoft. Without them, none of this would be possible. Now, a few things about City Conversations. How many old hats are in the room? Hank, yes. Okay, so you know that. Oh, look at that. So you know that we do not have speakers. We have presenters, who I will introduce in a moment. And we don't have an audience. Rather, all of you are participants, and you play a vital part in the dialogue that we hope to have over the next hour. Additionally, it's perfectly okay to eat your lunch. I hope some of you have brought your lunch. Finally, before we get started, there's a list that Queenie has going around. And that, please sign up if you would like to keep up to date on all things SFU City Conversations. So, with all of that um, taken care of, let's get to the topic at hand. Over the last decade, narratives about crucially important topics, climate, housing crises, drug crises, transportation, uh, big transportation shifts, have taken center stage in our news cycle and the collective conscious, consciousness of greater Vancouverites. Discourse about these complex issues has become highly polarized, crowded with misinformation and intentional um, dissuasion from facts. Biased, misleading, and incorrect information has long influenced public policy development to varying degrees, but we argue to begin that our current age of disinformation is witnessing a rise in alternative facts and the public delegitimization of experts and indeed expertise. The misinformed and the willfully ignorant often dominate the conversation drowning out both expert analysis and constructive public and community input. And this is detrimental to the people that policies are trying to help and to the direction of our civil society. We have three presenters today to help frame this conversation before we open it up to uh, all of us. Each presenter will be given seven minutes to provide some context from their specific area of practice. And then we will have some, uh, Queenie is going to then run the mic for you to provide your questions and comments. So first to my right, Dr. June Francis is the director of the Institute for Diaspora Research and Engagement at Simon Fraser University and an associate professor in the Beattie School of Business. She is the co-founder of the Co-Laboratorio Project, which works to strengthen collaboration learning and innovation for more inclusive, resilient solutions in governance, policies, and industry practice. She is also co-chair of the board of the Hogan's Alley Society 
And uh, in that respect, she leads an organization whose mission is to advance the social, political, economic, and cultural well-being of people of African descent in Vancouver through the delivery of housing, built spaces, and programming. Welcome, June. Melody Ma, to her uh, right, is a civic and community advocate, writer, and technology worker. She is a neighborhood advocate for Vancouver's Chinatown, leading a campaign called hashtag Save Chinatown YVR. She has also led other civic campaigns, such as Save Our Skyline, um, Save Our Skyline YVR for Vancouver's View Cones, the real fight for beauty.ca that highlighted the role of art washing by real estate developers in Vancouver, the rollback of the new City of Vancouver logo, and other campaigns. Finally, to Melody's right, Gordon Price, previously the director of the city program here at SFU, is a fellow with the SFU Center for Dialogue. In 2002, he finished his sixth term as a city councillor of this city. And he has also served on the board of Metro Vancouver and was appointed to the first board of TransLink in 1989. He is a stalwart blogger and podcaster on urban issues, holding this space for a long time for our city with a focus on Vancouver, um, including his Price Tags blog and Price, Tag Price Talks podcast. Welcome, all three of you. Dr. Francis, over to you to okay. start the conversation. Thank you. I'm sure I'll figure out how to get my, oh, somebody has got my <laughs> slides going. Good. Am I advancing them? I can just do that here, I guess. Okay. All right. So you know who I am, and I, I don't want to uh, use my seven minutes. I've never said anything in seven uh, minutes before. Um, am I going the wrong way? Okay. All right. So many of you, uh, to what I want to talk to do, you, you today about is a, is a misinformation about the people of African descent has been historical. Um, it's not new for us. Uh, it continues. And that is essentially the erasure of who we are and what we are. Um, the fact that we, um, in this country, they, uh, most of us who know anything about, uh, who look at ourselves and, and the discourse of Canadians, spend an awful lot of time talking about the Underground Railroad, okay? Every school child, most immigrants, most people in Canada can recite to you that the Underground Railroad existed. And as far as the Canadians are concerned, that's their relationship to people of African descent. They were rescuers. Um, and there's a, Alfred Cooper points out, um, I think quite, persuasively, that it lasted for 30 years, the Underground Railroad. But what did last for 200 years was slavery, okay? And I want to just read something quickly to you. Um, the UN came here to Canada and um, concluded the following, uh, the working group on, of people of African descent. It said, despite Canada's reputation for promoting multiculturalism and diversity, the working group is deeply concerned about the human rights situations of African Canadians. Canada's history of enslavement, racial segregation, marginalization has had a deleterious impact on people of African descent. History informs anti-black racism and st racial stereotype that are so deeply entrenched in institutions in Canada Politics and practices that its institutional and systemic forms are, e are either functionally normalized, functionally normalized, or rendered invisible, especially to the dominant group. Our erasure, in other words, has been recognized, and yet it continues to inform much of what Canada thinks of itself. And it takes many forms. A, a particularly dangerous form, I think, is minimizing us. So Canada tends to look at the facts, and, and if you look at our history books, if you look at what you learn in school, if you look at our institutional memory, if you look at policy, if you look at the, our historical record, if you look at what uh, we count and how we count them, we are essentially rendered as invisible to this country. It's, we're minimized. And we're normally, and we're told colorblind. How many times have I been told by Canadians for some reason that they don't see color? And the first time I got told that, 
I got totally confused at how many Canadians are colorblind. <laughs> <laughs> Among other things, selective memory, the Underground Railroad, um, uh, and we, we don't exist in records and statistics, and this is the form that becomes particularly problematic for us. When it comes to Vancouver, of course, many of you know about our erasure, because in fact, like many um, black communities across this country, we were always, um, uh, our erasure meant that we were pathologized, okay? Me meaning where we lived as part of the, the history of systemic racism, we were always rendered as the people that needed to be fixed. The people who lived in places that needed to be erased so that nice white people could move in. And so in Vancouver, of course, it meant the erasure of the black community by the establishment and the building, and I don't have a lot of time, we can go into this in more, uh, of, of, of <laughs> this that I call the monument to black oppression, because this viaduct went to the very heart of the black community, displaced the black community, fragmented the black community, and has had impact to this very day. You would think that would be a record that Vancouver would have contended to with when it decided that it would bring down the viaduct. But of course not, because by erasing us from the past, by rubbing us out from history, what it meant was that when they were going to redevelop this area, the Northeast Falls Creek Plan, we did not show up. And when black citizens went out and said, you have actually displaced us and you actually cannot benefit, the slave owners cannot benefit from slavery, from the dismantling of slavery. We, you need to actually redress what you did to the black community they looked at us and said, of course, we will. We need you to make it vibrant. We will definitely put up a plaque. <laughs> <laughs> definitely and of course, the black community, we've had a long history of understanding our marginalization, um, went back and said, no, you will not. This will not happen. And through a, 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 a number of our own aggressive efforts, um, we managed to get ourselves embedded in the Northeast Wall Street plan to return this block to the stewardship of the black community. But here's my point. My point is that erasure is, is, has been the misinformation of our entire existence. It started when we got on those, um, those boats on the transatlantic slave trade. It was absolutely essential to erase our identity because when you make us, you render us invisible as people, when you render our history invisible, you can contend with treating us in a certain way. This is a picture of the Nora Hendricks house, uh, the Hogan's Alley Society with the city of Vancouver, uh, the, the province and Portland Housing uh, Society uh, got together and part of the redress on the Hogan's Alley was to establish a home for homeless people, all right? Uh, that prioritize black and indigenous people. I will stop here except this, but I do wanna say this. Final statement. When we decided to do this, and we worked together to do this, what became absolutely uh, <coughs> critical was that we understood our erasure was almost complete. Why? Because the city of Vancouver does not collect data that's disaggregated by race. So of course that meant that what they had, they were blind to the issues. So when we said that black and indigenous people are overrepresented in policing and homelessness and everything else, it was okay for the city to say, you know what, we don't know. We don't know because we don't count. This, by the way, is across the city, across every level of the institution, and across every level of education, including our own SFU. Black people and our contributions have been largely erased. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you, Dr. Francis, for an impassioned speech. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences as a civic advocate and some case studies to frame this conversation about disinformation. So when we think about disinformation uh, right now, we often think about like anti-vaxxers. We think about Russian interference in the US. We think about Brexit. Um, we also think about social media sites like Facebook and Twitter and their role in disinformation. Um, and their governments are going to, to these social media companies and saying like, you need to do something about this, right? With much resistance and now kind of they're, they're starting to get it. Um, so today I wanna talk about how government is also an agent of disinformation, of not just erasure, not just lack of information, but actually purposing, purposely using information to disinform um, so, so that they can make specific decisions. Um, and I thought instead of talking about real estate, which we thought talk about a lot of the times in Vancouver, um, I thought we can talk about design. So municipal disinformation in the context of design. Um, so the first case study is about the Vancouver logo. Um, so try to imagine what the Vancouver logo is in your head if you don't remember. Here, here it is. Um, this little bit on the side that this floral bit. Some people say it's a lotus to reflect lotus land. Other people, Mayor Gregor Robertson, um, said it was a squiggly bit. Um, so, actual words. Um, and then about two years ago, uh, there was this brilliant idea that a priority is to redesign the logo for the city of Vancouver. In case you missed it, it looks something like this. And everybody was outraged. The portion of the population was saying, well, my eight-year-old can design this. Why did you spend $8,000? Um, another segment of the population, so creatives and designers said, well, um, this is undervaluing design. This is not the proper design process or diligence. You can't just put an identity out there without anybody really knowing. Um, so this caused such an uproar that one of my friends who is an active, engaged um, citizens and poli politics and civic um, issues, he even said, like, my mom, who doesn't talk to me about political anything, like, sat me down the other day to ask me about, like, what I thought about this logo. So everybody was really enraged. Right, um, but what was interesting is that this um, the mayor and council needed to ratify this new logo for it to be used. Uh, so during the city council meeting, I, I actually wish I was able to uh, read the actual transcript or show you clips, but the city is actually going through like a technology change right now, so you can't view anything before last November. So I'm gonna try my best to recite what they, they, they said. Uh, so yes, they didn't like the squiggly bit was one. Um, another counselor said that they liked the bold, boldness of the new logo because it's like Burger King's logo where it's like bolder um, and that people needed to get with the times like when VCR came along and people were refusing to adopt it and this is like the VCR. So it was all of this like they were throwing the kitchen sink um, at this logo so that they can move this along. So that was at the council and mayor level. Um, what was interesting is when you looked at uh, the, the documents from the staff report, they gave three reasons. The first reason of why this logo was necessary was that it would um, be more meaningful and easier to identify for non-English speakers. And when you look at this logo, you go, it's three English words, right? At least the other one had a squiggly bit. <laughs> so that didn't really make sense. And the second one was that uh, the logo is being used on social media accounts in this digital age, and we needed a logo that really fit that social media context. So if you put this logo on Instagram or Twitter, this is what it looks like. Can you actually see the logo? It's there. 
It's right here. So, <laughs> so it actually doesn't work because it's very long. And so when you put it on social media in a circle, it's very hard to see. Um, and also, if you want to adopt a pet rat, it's $5 PSA. Um, and they can be trained to use a rat toilet. Anyways, <laughs> actual PSA. I, I didn't even, yeah, it's the latest one. Anyways, going back to the logo. The third reason that was more probable um, was because they needed a redesign for their innovation economy. They want to develop this tech and food truck and innovation and creative economy. And I identify as part of that because I'm a tech worker. Um, and I can tell you that redesigning a city's logo is kind of the least of the priorities when it comes to developing an innovation economy. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so to put it into context, uh, when you think about innovative cities or cities with like robust innovation economy, so um, Waterloo, San Francisco, Mountain View, do you know what their logo looks like? Probably not. I did until I looked it up, and you can go look it up. They're you know, they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was the third reason was because they needed to redesign the logo to position the city as an innovation economy um, city. Right, those were the three reasons. And I still can't make it out why, why it is. It, so it's really interesting. So from the city and mayor's, um, city council and mayor's level, you have the framing of their arguments. And then at the staff level, you also have these three reasons. Um, that's one. And so I'm going to spend in my last minute to talk about the second case study, which is a Vancouver's view cone. This is the view um, from uh, Canby Street when you're coming down from um, City Hall. And it's one of my favorite views. Uh, we have over 20 of these view cones across the city. And what the view cones mean is that you can see this backdrop of the mountains with the city in front. Um, in this goalpost area right there, you, uh, developers can't build um, above that to cover the mountain. So then our, our mountain view is preserved. So um, as actually part of the Northeast Falls Creek plan, three buildings are proposed to cover um, kind of this area towards the right of this photo uh, and, and it was going to be the first decision that was going to be made, it was unprecedented, um, to cover up this, these, this mountain with these buildings. And what was really interesting is this public discourse, people were saying like, well, you know, this view was created because the mayor, it, mayor at the mayor's office wanted this view. Um, what was interesting is at that time, it was actually Ray Spaxman, the uh, director of planning um, that fought for the, these views against um, Mayor Gordon Campbell, who wasn't that in love with them. Um, the sec so that was on the public side. But when it came to decision ma making on the mayor and council side um, last summer, I believe, uh, when they had to approve this one building, the, the, the decision making and the context for it or the reasons that the mayor and council gave were one, um, this view, you can only view it when you're sitting in a car. So if you sit in the car for too long and you looked at the view while you're driving, you might get into an accident. So this view isn't necessary and we have have to go, you know, rethink about having views in more public spaces. And of course, you can view this view on the sidewalk. There are views if you look at the documents. Um, the views are view cones are designed with public space in mind. Um, the second one was actually from Mayor Gregor Robertson himself, saying that well, for advocates who are so passionate about these views, I would like to see them advocate for the traffic lights to be brought down and for the trees to be sh um, chopped off because they are covering the views. Um, so that was how Mayor and Council framed their argument in order to make the decision for the buildings to go through. Um, so those are the two case studies um, that I wanted to put out there for your consideration and hopefully we'll have a dialogue around how we push back as engaged citizens and as activists and advocates um, around disinformation that comes from municipal government. Thank you. Can I just use the podium? Yeah. Great. 
So are these examples and the others you're familiar with in this age of social media sufficient illustrations to justify the argument that we now are in an age where misleading information, disinformation has so polluted and corrupted public dialogue, body politic, our legislative instruments? And I'm going to say, nope, nope, this is all pretty familiar. 15 years on city council, uh, these are good examples, uh, but they're not really different in quality, if I can say that, different in quality uh, than I, I can well remember. <laughs> I got some worse examples. What has changed this scale? The ability of Melody, or June, or any of us to make a case load it up with misinformation, if that's our strategy, and get it out faster and to more people, unquestionably that has changed. But I would say it hasn't damaged us to the point where the threat is so great it has undermined our basic ability to govern ourselves. At the municipal level, here, Certainly make a case. Damage has been done and will continue to be so. But the reality is I think we are dealing with something that is new, a new technology. It is having its effect. We are trying to cope with that. We still don't know quite how to deal with it or, or even what the further results of this are going to be. But that's always been true. Okay. Mass production of the Bible. The belief of its advocates that once people have the word of God in their hand, they will understand what God intended, there will be unity, there may not even be a need for a church. It was followed by about a century and a half of the bloodiest internal wars uh, that Europe had ever faced. Radio. Television. Social media of all kinds. We've been there before. And like any virus, we're going to have to cope with it. Yeah, some can kill you. But I think we're at the stage where we're learning how to cope. And we will. If something can't go on forever, it won't. And a unrelieved strategy of misinformation so corrupting that it makes it unable for us to govern ourselves will be met by at least some kind of interventions that will change what would be the worst outcomes. On that, I remain, if not optimistic, I think realistic. Now, at the legislative level, I use that broadly, city council, we do have ways, as we always have had, to deal with this, these challenges. Differing points of view, misinformation, misunderstandings, the ability to recognize where we may be going in a wrong direction and to adjust. And I think in both the cases that we saw here, that's exactly what happened. Cases were made, arguments were made, analysis were done, motions were moved, policies were changed, new structures were established. The system worked, worked very much as it was intended to. And I think there are at least two good reasons why that's the situation, at least here. We have confidence in ourselves, in our institutions, and in the people we elect. We may disagree. I hope we do. It's the nature of the system. But we still have confidence in the fundamental ability of those institutions to work and to do as good a job as we would hope they could under the circumstances where there is no perfect solution to anything. We have processes that we have refined over the years. Sometimes they fail, most often they work. And we have the second thing, we have damn good staff. We pay them well, we try and hire the best, and we charge them with providing as much as possible nonpartisan, in the true sense of the word, information to the decision makers so that they can, with their own political instincts, 
filter that information that they need to make the decisions. Maybe they do it for political purposes. They're politicians. That's their job. But they do get at least the ability to have the issues framed, analyzed, documented, so that if they wish to take advantages, most do, they can make the best possible decisions. I don't think that has changed. In fact, I think in some ways it's better. As staff, counselors, and we all begin to learn how better to use these technologies and the information that flows, we are getting better at it. The viral response is beginning to click in. It is going to be more and more difficult to distinguish truth from reality. Boy, wait till the 5G and the ability to duplicate video to the point you can't tell the difference. It's already true for voicemail. Why? What happens when you can't tell truth anymore? We will find a way. We will. And we are. So in that respect, I remain by and large, uh, hmm, I don't think complacent. But I see no reason at this point, at least in the frame that I've given, our institutions in this city at this time to, begin, to deal with what this paper says, laid out our mandate, bias, misleading, and incorrect information influencing public policy to varying degrees. This is correct. This has always been true. Social media has not changed the fundamentals so much as the scale, and we're in the midst of accommodating ourselves to these technologies as we have before. Did it kill us, our institutions? There's the threat. But I'm optimistic, hopeful, I think realistic, that it won't. So if, uh, if the presenters could please take your seats. I'm going to, uh, as, as you let those diverse and interesting thoughts percolate, I'm gonna use my moderator's privilege and pose an initial question. So I hear a lot about the, and Gord, your remarks just sort of hammered this home about the fact that there is more and more information circulating now that gives us more potential to mobilize to act and that we have this potential then in society with all of our new technological prowess to have fact-driven policy. But what I hear June saying, what I hear Melody saying, and what I hear you referencing with no sort of problem, I mean, as a problem, but as a long-standing problem, is that what we more often have is um, policy-driven facts. So facts that are chosen selectively because they support particular policies, whether they're racist policies, whether they're educational policies that, that disadvantage or that erase certain things, whether they're building policies, design policies, etc. So my question for, for you is... Um, how do you see this new um, atmosphere in which you're all working to a greater or lesser degree by using social media and using new processes of, of collecting opinion and collecting um, energy behind your different campaigns? Um, how do you see this as, as being a new game? Um, and who have been some of your surprising allies in your work uh, on, in Hogan's Alley, for example, trying to make use of this potential? Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, it's, it's an interesting question because I've had to think through when you're saying that to what extent uh, this new media um, has been supportive, helpful, in what ways it has been detrimental because it has been both. Uh, and in what ways has it created larger support basis for us and for what we're doing? I think there's no doubt that what this has allowed us to do is to mobilize across the country in ways a community as small and as fragmented as ours um, have not been able to do. And the first time I really saw the power of this was when Black Panther came out. <laughs> so Black Panther came out, it turns out that I actually was told to go to the Black Panther movie, and I thought it was about the Black Panther organization. <laughs> <laughs> so I show up, only to see people dressed 
<laughs> and all kinds of crazy things. But why did I go? I go went because I got told on Black in Vancouver webpage that this is what you do today. You, you go to that Black Panther movie, and we all showed up, took over the movie, and for the first time, in, in very, we created some sense of unity. We have been heavily involved in the city now in terms of um, working with Nora Hendricks House and a variety of other things, including one of the processes we went through is getting the Black community together to talk about how they experience parks in the city. And what the, what the, the media around that was what was so helpful to bring it out young people who all then, not just Hogan Valley, you know, directly associated with us, but we met black people from across the city that came out in unison. So the media and our ability to spread the word has certainly united a community that was fragmented by this and has created virtual community for us. And that virtual community has been influential in terms of helping inform how we work with the city and other places. Um, I don't want to dominate, so I, I think I'm going to stop there, and maybe you can jump in with some other ideas. I want to use the mic. I, know I didn't answer all three. Thank you. Elements, but. Okay. Um, so for myself, I don't know civic advocacy before social media because I got involved in advocacy uh, through social media. You can, you know, here's some of my campaign hashtags. It's a hashtag, save Chinatown YVR, save our skyline YVR. Um, and it's been, like June said, uh, a immobilizing force. It's very easy to identify who might be your ally and who's not your ally and broadcast your message uh, for a call to action, as well as because a lot of politicians, a lot of media folks are on Twitter, especially, uh, you, that trickles out into a broader audience. So a tweet can go into, can be the next day on the newspaper, for example. So it's been useful from a broadcasting as well as an organizing standpoint. Um, for social media, what has been built in in terms of incentivizing us to keep using these devices are sort of engagement strategies, right? So you become obsessed with the data around the information and the messages that you are broadcasting out. So for example, you want to see how many impressions your tweet has moved um, have gotten or how many likes or how many retweets and you measure the success of that message based on those metrics that have def been defined for you by those platforms because they want you to keep on using and being addicted to to um, to their software as someone who designs that type of stuff. Um, but that has created uh, this environment in which we just design our messaging to those statistics to get more followers to get more likes to get retweets and you know what really works is outra outrage and very smart insults you know and i've been caught in that spiral before too um, and that is why we're in this environment now where smart insults and outrage is dominating the conversations on these pl public platforms. And so now there is, from a technology standpoint, um, a rethink of whether that is healthy, which is not, and how can we move forward to actually create healthy conversations on these platforms, which was what was the intent uh, through the power of design, through the power of decision making and ethics. And that's from a technology and someone who works in tech, those are the types of questions um, the industry is asking itself. So I'll end there. How many of you have inoculated yourself? Do you no, no longer have a Facebook site? No longer use Twitter? Uh, are far more selective in what you choose to read. Hands up, please. Okay, early stages of inoculation. As it's clear, has become absolutely clear that these, uh, these media and devices can be used to divide, to create 
disagreement, hatred, uh, particularly at election time, by external players, we're in the process of inoculation. And that, I think, is only going to continue. There's going to be increasing demand for verification of reality, truth. We will be prepared to pay for it. We've always paid for media of some kind or another. The illusion of free uh, has resulted in these negative effects, so we will find a way, uh, we will have to find a way, we will find a way. But I suspect there will be a reduction in this kind of outrage, because you can't sustain it. At the city level, in fact, I would argue there is far more consultation than there has ever been. I think that's fair to say, Anne. Maybe not ever been, but there's a lot. And a lot of it is devoted for the opportunity for people to decompress. Less outrage, more interaction, more ability to address those wrongs or misinformation or erasure, if you wish. Sure, yeah. And, and provide a corrective way of doing it. We're pretty good at it. This society is pretty good at that, and I expect it's going to get better. That's the message. Can I add something? I just feel compelled to do this. Um, one of the great advantages for us as Black people is when you have been erased historically, social media, media has been a boon for us, an enormous boon. We have for centuries been trying to explain how we have been treated by authorities. I am telling you that I have gotten more of my colleagues finally looking at me and, uh, and my friends finally after knowing me for decades where they've always been telling me that every time there is a police encounter and I have tried to explain what happens to my family and to people who look like me, Historically, before we had the evidence in social media, I was always lectured about the fact that I wasn't interpreting the situation well. When that young man crossed, many of you saw that Granville Street in our own city, who was a UBC uh, graduate, a, a football player, and cross a street that everybody here crosses every day and jaywalk. I didn't even know it was a, a crime to cross that part of Granville Street that only had buses. And that was a jaywalking thing. I didn't even realize it. But this young man crosses the street and he's taken down by the police. And he is filmed and five times tasered, kicked and other things. Why do we now believe it? Because there was irrefutable evidence on social media. And that has, we hope one day, we hope it has, you know, what's been surprising to me is how little things have actually changed, despite the fact now is that we are now documenting these things. But for people who have been erased and invisible and our experience have been minimized and we have, have been told that we are always wrong, this couldn't possibly happen in Canada, it never happened. For us, this has been a major plus to create information where there has been complete silence. Thank you. Your turn. Questions, uh, Queenie's got a mic. Uh, questions, comments, please let us know your first name and uh, keep your comments uh, to the point so that we ha can provide the maximum uh, dialogue. Awesome, hi, my name is Ben. Um, I, when we're talking about, I guess, how disinformation affects policy, I find it just as important to talk about how the policymaker makes the policy as it is how the policymaker gets into the seat. Um, and I feel like the disinformation age has, a, has had a huge effect on how we elect our governments and who these people are who are making these decisions. Um, I find it difficult to talk about how we go through the process of deciding how a policy gets passed um, and that it's about the rational decision makers around that table when we haven't taken a step back and talked about who are the decision makers that are not only making these policies, but also appointing these quote unquote neutral staff um, who will then provide the analysis, not just for this council to reaffirm those positions, but also for future ones. Um, I'm curious in all of your opinions, uh, how 
disinformation has affected elections in Vancouver uh, and how, from a policy perspective, uh, we can try to push for fact-informed policy with potentially biased council members. If I didn't hear you make a case for... It's a question. Yeah, but I didn't hear you make the case. You're saying that... Uh, that like, how, how has misinformation has... Uh, affected elections? Well, I think yeah. we can look both Canada-wide as well as globally... Um, we are seeing unprecedented elections of far right wing individuals uh, or more right wing individuals uh, than we have before. Oh, uh, really? Really? The election of far right individuals? Seriously, dude? Okay, just answer the question. Yeah, no, I mean, again, I just don't think you're making your case. But, okay. but can you answer the question? Do you want, well, do you want to address the I question? Did. If, I don't think you've made your case. I don't think it has fundamentally changed. You, you don't believe that money in politics has affected the way that we elect leaders or changed the way that we have perspectives on public policy dialogues in a way wait, different wait, from I the think past? If the, the, the original question, if I can, I think maybe would, would, would be helpful to address, which is how, does, how do we um, create an environment where facts are informing policy given that policymakers in their seats ha carry biases. The way we do it? Well, how do we do it, Gord? Through the democratic process, uh, elections, uh, come on. Through elections, okay. Uh, uh, absolutely, the, the engagement of people. I I, I, maybe I'm missing something here then. Okay, well, I don't think you from, are, but hear I, I hear your perspective. <laughs> I think I'll maybe add another dimension to this. I, I feel with um, social media and sort of the degradation of um, media in general, given the media environment, um, a lot, uh, there's a lot of hot takes. There's a lot of uh, race for a clickbait because you need to get as many people to go on your site so you can get those ad impressions, right? Um, so the combination of t those two things have created very simple headlines, very simple um, uh, uh, information is kind of conveyed in a very simple way. So I was debating the other day about like the Car uh, Kim Kardashianism of politics in Canada or in the U.S. or globally. Right, we have very pretty people who are put as the mouthpiece of their party, um, and then other parties want to copy that very similar model. And what you get in combination with social media, with um, media, uh, and the trend is that um, we're getting these very simple solutions and very simple kind of policy statements during the campaign trail, and and also when politicians are, who are elected are starting to govern. But when you have you a simple... See, when you look at this council and others in the region, when you look at the regional boards, is that what you see? Yeah. Yes, we see a very oh. quick simplification of what um, of solutions, simple solutions to very complex and wicked problems that our region are facing, right? Sometimes politicians just go, okay, well, X is your solution. As someone who advocates sometimes against those positions, it's very hard to take very complex <laughs> situations and boil it down to something that is easily conveyed in a 240 character tweet or something that could get the attention of media. And oftentimes when you're thinking about a campaign, that's what you spend a lot of your time doing is how do I convey these very, very complex ideas to something very, very simple. And wouldn't it be so much easier if I can just come up with a very simple solution and just tweet that out? And and I there was a moment, I remember when I was designing a campaign, understanding why it's so easy for people to glam on to these simple solutions, um, which isn't to the benefit of what we actually need to do for the challenges we face. Let me, um, I'm just going to take a quick, and I won't be that long, and we can, I know you'd want some more quest answers, but I'm going to take the opposite, which is the proof is in the pudding. Let's just look at the composition of our elected bodies and the composition of the people who make decisions. <laughs> if you look at, <laughs> we see a homogeneous group of people. 
We do not reflect. I have done studies on the board of sin and governance of, of nonprofits and ABC. 13% are visible minorities in a, in a, in a, in a city and, and in regions where over 50% of the people are visible minorities. We look at the city council and we see a similar homogeneity. We look at, at, at planning staff and this is where it is shocking absolutely shocking. Now here is a whole profession, a whole profession that has only primus, uh, the, I mean, privileged one point of view. Because when those people are the only people making decisions, they don't get the benefit of my perspective and Melanie's perspective and a variety of people who live in the city and who have informed opinions and lived experiences and bring to this place a variety of perspective from various um, gender orientations, etc. So I just want to say that it's by de facto you're going to get bias when you only have one group of people running and deciding for us. Okay, wait, before Jim, going, before I can you absolutely guarantee that this council gets the benefit of your perspective <laughs> before before Gord gets gets too carried away I will say that uh, that councillor price if I'm not mistaken was the first openly gay councillor on Vancouver City Council second in Canada no one remembers second <laughs> okay so I'd like to I'd like to get a few more questions or comments please Hi, I'm Erwin, a graduate researcher at SFU in communications. I look at uh, reconciliation washing uh, and its effects on municipal policy in Vancouver. Um, and I just think there's some examples uh, with the Squamish Nation billboards at the South End of Broad Bridge or the tower proposals. Um, the, 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 the humor that Kitts Point residents talk about civic blight um, when fa in fact that requires a significant amount of colonial denial uh, and it and we look at the roots of Vancouver it's a white supremacist roots so I think if we don't look at the history of Vancouver it's easy for us to miss those opportunities to learn that Squamish residents lived in the village of Snoke were removed and now the fact that they want to have some economic development on their site is is somehow civic blight the other example I'd bring up is the city uh, the where there's where the city of reconciliation but the VAG wants $235 million for a new home, and yet doesn't, doesn't even have a token Coast Salish gallery. So I don't know what, how we can be a city of reconciliation. The other example is not able to rename Stanley Park. Just before you go, Gordon, um, the other example I'd say is, is how we deploy words like social mix. Social mix is great for the downtown east side because poor people should have are required of social mix, but we don't do social mix on the west side. So the use of social mix both in municipal staff I see municipal staff more than council. Um, how how words we can can be very powerful and and they're hidden. Their meaning is hidden. Okay, thanks, Erwin. Can I just ask if we could have this question here because I'm afraid that we that might be our final question. Is it really? It uh, might be. I know. Uh, we're just getting going. I'm just wondering um, when did lying become acceptable? That not very long ago, a politician was caught lying. It was the end of his career. And now we're talking about disinformation as though it's acceptable. And at least half of it is deliberately misleading. I mean, not, uh, not just misinformed, but deliberate lies. And it, nobody seems to be as offended about it. And politicians get away with lying all the time, which wouldn't have happened a few years ago. Okay, thank you. So now. So what's the reason? <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, I'm going to jump in here and say, <laughs> I think it's because, I think we're alerted to it because the lies have changed. Okay? So when you think about lying, we've always lied about the place of Indigenous people, right? And who we are. That's been a lie. Right? Most of Canada lies about that. And, and our history is one of telling a lie, right? But the lies were different. The lies about black people, uh, that we were not so smart, that we, whatever it is we come up with to justify the fact that we treat you poorly, those are lies. Lies about people, sexual orientation and the impact it had on our communities. We had all kinds of lies about that. 
about how it's going to make us all become, you know, I, I won't go into it. I won't tell the lie again. <laughs> but um, so, so I think what has changed for me, looking at, at the lies, is the nature of the lies. And I think the fact that they're, they're lies that are now affecting um, the, the dominant group or, or, or in some ways is become more a, 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 a transparent to us. But I think we have always been living a lie in many ways. I think the key word you used is transparent. So this is much more transparent. The processes are more transparent. I would say that social media has assisted in that but it still basically relies on the legitimacy of the institution, the people in it, and the processes we use. And I would not step back from that. I'm actually more encouraged by the fact that they are more transparent, that many of these issues we either didn't talk about, or yes, lied, we don't. There will be no report coming out of city council that suggests what the Squamish are doing is blight. There will be no report that suggests they're not legitimate. There will be no report that doesn't background the situation there. That is a very reasonable expectation. I think you believe it. And yes, there may be people who will say ugly things. They may deliberately try to distort. But the institution and the people in it, I have confidence in them. Okay. We do have time for one more question. Mr. Soron. Yeah, I think one thing that concerns me about the... One thing that's concerning me regionally is a lot of conspiratorial thinking and bullying. And I'm thinking particularly up in West Van, where there were, I think, quite serious accusations that, that uh, staff at TransLink had faked data um, and that they were manipulating ridership data to push a beeline on the community that the community didn't want. And some of these messages were amplified quite repeatedly by the media and by elected officials, including anonymous uh, business owners uh, or anonymous people running troll accounts um, with promoted posts on Facebook and so on. So it captures a lot of the stuff that we've seen here. Um, I'm just wondering, what do you think the role is of both the media and elected officials in calling this out instead of sort of making space for it as a legitimate part of a debate. With respect to the B line in West Vancouver, almost identical, everything that you mentioned there was worse with the B line on Granville Street. We went through the same thing. It was ugly. Three nights, worst public hearing, awful, awful stuff. And yet, I think we made the right decision and we listened. We did. We spent those three nights and we recognized yes, some people will distort. Some may lie. There were certainly accusations that staff was doing that, heard all of that. So you still, in the end, have to rely on the institution. It's not the media, yes, if they do their job. And I will say that the major downside that I've seen of social media, the Facebooks and the Googles, is they have so weakened what we used to call mainstream media that it's difficult for all of us to join in that same understanding, have the same basis. Even if we disagree with it, we at least have the same one. Uh, however, I still think that in the end it comes, I'm going to say again, repeating, and I will end, that I believe the institutions have held. I'm not as optimistic, okay? <laughs> I, I, I got to tell you. And yet I've seen a lot of movement, but there's a lot left to be done. Recently, uh, just, and I know Melanie want to get in and we're about going, but I'll just say this. We realize that Black and Indigenous people are overrepresented in homelessness. I never got to tell you that story. We found out also that the city of Vancouver has opted out of using race-based data in the homeless count. Opted out. We fought the city, put in a race-based data. I won't go into the details, but I will tell you that that that's question that was put in was inaccurately inserted knowingly by the city that it would lead to a politically uh, expedient outcome, but an inaccurate one. So it's not as obvious. Nobody's out there saying uh, reconciliation is not going to occur, but the subtle ways in which many of these things are still, there's a still a lot of pushback in terms of uh, 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 the politicization of how data is collected, how it's used, who gets to use it, who owns it, how it's exported. I still can't get the raw data on the homeless count. Okay? And that's just an example of the 
number of places in which it's still an, a colonized mind. It is still institutions have been colonized and, and the white supremacy angle that you're talking about still permeates. And there is abject fear. There's so much fear that if we tell the truth, something terrible is going to happen. The truth is the truth. Like how many black indigenous homeless people are there? Why are we afraid of that? <laughs> I don't get it. That's correct. I, I actually worked on, on the design of a homeless county. And I, I think those questions are part of it. You know, I, I'm telling you right people. now, race-based data was the first time it was put on. And it is put on in a way that will lead to inaccuracy. We can take that offline. But in the most recent one, it was the first time race-based data was on it in the recent and it was inaccurately included. Yeah. I guess I want to conclude with two maybe solutions I want to throw out there and then one thought question for you to take away. So um, one, just bouncing off your comment is around transparency of data, whether it is data collection, the decisions, and then also the outcome, the actual data and having more transparency around that, especially uh, when we're moving into the age of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So um, two is uh, moving away from technology, as we mentioned previously. So for example, that whole um, uh, decision around route rerouting because of the viaducts um, in Strathcona, rerouting a specific road, and, in, and they involved uh, citizens to come in to really think about all of the inputs and recommend a solution. So really involving the community in decision making so that they know what the trade-offs are. And third, in terms of something to kind of take away and think about is when we think about media and journalism, we always say, well, it needs to be unbiased. It needs uh, to have both sides of the story. And some people are arguing that that type of framework has really given a, a rise to voices that might not necessarily um, be uh, conducive to a healthy conversation. So for example, when you have a story about vaccines, you might have a health expert saying, okay, vaccines are great. And then to kind of even things out so it's unbiased, we need to have an anti-vaxxer, right? And now the anti-vaxxer has a platform to, um, to project and promote their point of view. So rethinking that type of th framework when it comes to journalism um, that's, I think, something we might want to take away. Thank you very much, Melody. Great thoughts to end on. I would like to thank the presenters for these uh, very compelling and contentious perspectives on the misinformation age and what we can do about it. Uh, I hope that you leave feeling somewhat empowered and equipped to, to deal with the, the, the ongoing crisis of information uh, today. Um, thank you for being part of the 2019 Community Summit, and we look forward to seeing you at future SFU City Conversations. Thank you.